Well, hello everyone. This is Michael Martin, President and CEO of ECFA, along with Julie Beasley, ECFA's Senior Compliance Associate. It's our privilege to welcome you to our 2024 Taxes Made Easy webinar. Julie and I are here to summarize some of the top tax news and changes from the past year, impacting pastors, churches, and nonprofit ministries. We'll also be sharing takeaways, tools, and integrity tips. Get used to us saying that. Takeaways, tools, and integrity tips from our 2024 ECFA Tax and Financial Guides. More good news about that in just a moment. But first, just big picture. Through it all, we hope today's webinar and these resources will bring clarity to tax compliance to free you to focus on ministry, which is really what it's all about. Well, I'm excited to introduce my friend, Julie Beasley, who's joining me as a fellow CPA from the ECFA team in presenting today's webinar. Julie is Senior Compliance Associate here at ECFA. She joyfully serves our current members and coaches many of our new applicants through the ECFA accreditation process. Prior to ECFA, Julie worked for 20 plus years in public accounting with an emphasis on tax and nonprofits. She also served on the mission field in Ecuador before serving as the CFO for a mission agency. She believes strongly that a solid foundation in governance and financial compliance will lead an organization to much greater success. Well, amen to that. Julie, welcome to today's webinar. Great. Thank you so much. I'm excited to be here. Well, thank you. Hey, can I ask you to do the honors before we continue much further? Do you mind opening us up in a quick word of prayer? I sure would love to. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we are thankful for today. We're thankful for this webinar, for this chance to share ideas and tips. We're thankful for the people who will be listening in and are seeking to serve you and not only to serve you, but to serve you with excellence and integrity. I pray that you would bless this time, that you would bless the, the, the ideas and thoughts that we share uh, that it could bring honor and glory to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. <clears throat> well, thanks for that, Julie. Just a couple of other quick housekeeping items, and then we're going to get right to the topic of the hour. Whether you are new to ECFA webinars or you're a regular attendee, please listen closely to this message from our team as we've recently made changes to our webinar software and the way you can submit your questions and receive all-important CPE. <laughs> Take a listen. A copy of today's PowerPoint slides should be in your email inbox from this morning. If you did not receive them, please check your spam folder. They will also be included in the follow-up email after the webinar. This webinar qualifies for one credit of CPE or CEU. We will be displaying a series of continuing education codes throughout the presentation. When a code appears, like the example you see now, click the Code Words button on the right-hand side, enter the code, and submit. If you prefer, you can write down the codes throughout the session and submit all of them at the end. If you meet the requirements for earning continuing education, your certificate will be emailed to you one to three days after the webinar. If you have technical difficulties, please email your code words to webinar at ecfa.org. Lastly, the presenters are available to answer your questions during today's webinar. Please email your questions to webinar at ecfa.org. They will do their best to answer as many of your questions as possible. Well, thank you to our great team for that update and another very special announcement just for today's webinar. As an ECFA member and for those who are joining us live on today's webinar, we invite you to download your copy of ECFA's 2024 Tax and Financial Guides, and that is as a free gift for attending today's webinar. Um, check out the email in your inbox that was sent with today's webinar instructions. There you'll see the download link and, and the promo code that goes along with that. If you have any trouble at all, you can email webinar at ecfa.org. We'll be happy to help with those questions. It's our hope that these two guides from ECFA are a blessing to you this tax season, and not just in tax season, but really throughout the year as other financial questions and issues arise. Well, on a topic like taxes, we know there are sure to be questions, and you know what? We invite those. You can ask your questions by clicking Ask in the Q&A tab or by emailing us at webinar at ecfa.org. 
this is an important note, uh, especially for today. Please send your questions anytime during the webinar. We won't be holding a special Q&A time just at the end, uh, but because of the volume of questions we expect there to be, we're gonna be taking your questions all throughout the webinar using the platform. And Julie and I are gonna work as hard as we can to answer as many of your questions as we can. Well, with those important announcements, we're gonna launch right now into the main content today uh, in our webinar. And we're gonna kick it off here with summarizing some of the top tax changes from the past year. So Julie, would you please get us started here with some updates, especially related to the charitable giving front? Yes, yeah, thanks, Michael. The first legislation we wanna talk about is the Charitable Act. Over the years, historically, charitable deductions have been a strong giving incentive for taxpayers. But in 2017, the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act drastically changed the landscape of itemized deductions. And it did that by increasing the standard deduction and either eliminating or limiting some sections of itemized deductions. And the end result was just far fewer taxpayers are able to itemize. Now, during the pandemic, there was a provision that allowed non-itemizers to take a uh, charitable deduction, but that expired at the end of 21. This legislation would allow non-itemizers to claim a charitable deduction for up to one-third of the standard deduction, which would be a great benefit for taxpayers and for the ministries because it would, again, incentivize that giving. Now, I do want to point out, yesterday there was a tax deal that was announced, and while it had some really good things in it. It did not include this universal charitable deduction. So not sure what the chances of this legislation are, but we will be continuing to follow this and keeping you posted. Yeah, that's exactly right. Appreciate your mention of the universal charitable deduction. We even saw in our latest ECFA State of Giving report, you know, what the impact is when those sorts of policies are not in place, right? And so here at ECFA, uh, Julie, you know, we're continuing to monitor, like you said, this legislation. We're advocating on behalf of the nonprofit community for those kinds of policies that help support charitable giving. <clears throat> and, you know, <clears throat> and, you know, one thing we're confident about is that funds that go in the hands of ministries and churches, they just go much further than the impact through government tax revenue. So we continue to advocate for those kinds of policies. Well, also on our next topic, but related to charitable giving, we are continuing to see the growth in use. And we will say too, from some corners of the philanthropic community, criticisms related to donor advised funds or DAFs, as you may hear them referred to. So why, why they're so attractive? Well, DAFs allow givers an immediate tax deduction for irrevocably donated funds that can then be invested, grown, and later distributed to charities. So some of those timing aspects is what makes these really powerful. Again, that immediate tax deduction for then an opportunity for donors later to exercise these advisory privileges and making those distributions uh, to charity. Some critics allege that DAFs are being used by donors to, in their words, quote, stockpile, to stockpile assets that should be used more quickly on the front lines of charity. But on the other hand, DAF proponents argue that DAFs are an extremely effective vehicle for charitable giving, and they, they cite statistics like the ones you see here uh, related to grants and to payout rates and all the great things that are happening as a result of DAFs. So for purposes of today's webinar, again, we're just kind of touching on some of the highlights. I think the important takeaway here is that at this point, you know, there's no major DAF reform legislation that has passed Congress at this point. Um, so we're continuing to watch that. But in the meantime, you should know the IRS has recently issued new rulemaking and has invited public comment related to this topic. So in this rulemaking, uh, really the IRS focus primarily here is to clarify what constitutes a DAF. I mean, kind of at a basic level. And also what counts as a tax-exempt distribution um, coming through DAFs. In that rulemaking as well, we want to highlight the IRS is clarifying that, you know, basic restricted gifts 
those don't automatically trigger DAF rules. So that's that's an important point that's made. But then also on the other hand, regarding taxable distributions, which under current law are subject to excise tax penalties for the sponsoring organization and fund managers in this rulemaking, the IRS wants to clarify that political campaign work and lobbying on legislation, those kinds of expenses are specifically identified as taxable. While on the other hand, investments and reasonable investment grant related fees, those would not be taxable. So that's just kind of a quick overview of what we've seen there with the IRS and that rulemaking. This public comment period just recently closed. So again, we'll continue to watch and report on these developments. You can stay tuned at ecfa.org on our news page, um, as well as through the regular Pulse emails that we're sending out as well. All right, taking on our next recent development, let's talk for a moment here about the employee retention credit. Julie, how could we do a webinar on tax developments without at least referencing the employee retention credit, the ERC? So we're just going to give a quick recap. Um, I know there, there have been um, even entire webinars and, and more devoted to this topic, but just a quick overview. Uh, the ERC is a pandemic era refundable tax credit. It's for organizations that kept employees on their payrolls despite you know, some of those government forced suspensions of operations or significant declines in receipts that took place during the, the main crisis time period of COVID. <clears throat> now, what was so uh, helpful about this and beneficial for organizations that legitimately uh, took advantage of this credit is that they could potentially claim thousands of dollars in assistance per retained employee. And while there were many organizations that legitimately benefited from the ERC, unfortunately, we also saw a lot of abuse. Um, and that abuse was then met with a very aggressive, you might even say uncharacteristic response by the IRS, just cracking down on a lot of what was happening in the ERC space. As we ended the last quarter, uh, the final quarter of last year, this included a series of statements last fall from the IRS commissioner, essentially you know, halting, halting the processing of new ERC claims. Um, and then at the same time, uh, giving the IRS opportunity to put in more safeguards to prevent future abuse. And then in some of these same announcements, I mean, this is really get your attention. <laughs> the IRS is saying, we're gonna be working with the Justice Department to pursue fraud situations that have been fueled by some of this aggressive marketing. Along with that, the IRS also invited uh, a voluntary disclosure program for organizations who say, you know what, um, maybe we received an incorrect ERC and we want to pay it back. And with this program, there is the benefit of some discounted rates offered by the IRS. One just kind of important point here in terms of timing, as of this webinar recording, that special disclosure program runs through March 22nd of 2024. So if this is something that, you know, you're looking into your organization is considering, we encourage you to work with professional counsel in reviewing those opportunities, but just note that March 22nd deadline is important. And in the meantime, if you're looking for more credi credible information on the ERC, so not those, you know, texts and emails and crazy things that you you hear um, if you're looking for credible information, we do have a number of ECFA resources that are available on this topic and also some news posts as well that are based directly on IRS news and guidance. So we commend that to you related to the employee retention credit. And then, Julie, I think we're going to transition now to uh, a word on the Clergy Act, which would be important for a lot of folks who are tuning into this particular webinar. Yes, Michael, this will be the last legislation we'll cover in the recent developments, but maybe for many of you be the most important. Um, for ministers, as they're beginning their career, they have the opportunity to elect out of the Social Security system. And that means that they are removed from both paying into the system, but they're also removed later in life from receiving funds, benefits, services. And sometimes a minister will make this election and maybe regret it later. But unfortunately, the election is irrevocable in general. 
And so this legislation would open a temporary window that would allow a minister to elect back in to the Social Security system. Now, it moved out of the House Ways and Means Committee on a unanimous vote, which means there's a, some really good bipartisan support for this legislation. So this is one that could be important to our, our ministers. So we'll be keeping track of this and, and keeping you posted. Great. <clears throat> well, excellent job, Julie, covering that update. I know that is one that we do hear a lot of questions about from time to time. And it was encouraging to see that there's probably more momentum around that particular um, you know piece of legislation. Of course, still has um, some hurdles to overcome. But like you mentioned, more momentum than what we've seen in some of the previous attempts. So we'll continue to keep you posted. And then I think with that, we're going to transition now from you know, some of those recent developments, which I should say, by the way, there's um, a full outline of those in both of these tax guides that are free as part of today's webinar. And that'll be a great resource for you. There's also some very helpful tax tables that ha has all the annual, you know, inflation adjustments of the important provisions. And so be sure to check out the tax guides for those materials. But now we're going to transition over from recent developments to remember, I had said earlier, we're going to be covering you know, some takeaways, tools, and integrity tips um, from the ECFA tax guides. And, you know, if you put kind of the, the page count of both of these guides together, some, something like 400 pages. So we're not going to be able to, um, you know, cover all of that ground during our time period. But in the spirit of making taxes easy, which is what this webinar is all about, you know, those guides are really your go-to resource. So what Julie and I have done, you know, we've been involved in these guides for a number of years. Uh, we're just going to kind of go through um, each of them and pull out from the different sections. You know, what is one big takeaway? If we had to narrow it down to one tool and one integrity tip from each section, um, we're going to do that walkthrough with you today. So let's start with the minister's tax and financial guide. And, and right there at the beginning, you know, the first um, chapter, that first section is on taxes for ministers. And really here, the one big takeaway would be that qualifying as a quote minister, and I put that term in quotes because it is a technical definition um, under the tax law, minister of the gospel, qualifying as a minister under the tax law, this has significant implications. <laughs> And uh, really, that kind of frames what the rest of, in some ways, this whole guide is about. So just to highlight a few of the special rules for ministers, those include things like qualifying for housing allowance, being considered self-employed for Social Security tax purposes. Ministers are considered self-employed. Even if they're employees for income tax purposes, they're considered self-employed for Social Security tax purposes. Um, and that means that they pay under the SECA tax system and not FICA tax. We'll continue to, to unpack that a bit. And there's also another uniqueness, which is an exemption from SECA tax, but that's under rare circumstances. So we've just kind of given you a handful there of some of those and all that to say that when it comes to taxes for ministers, it's just different. <laughs> and if I can even say this a little bit more challenging than for most taxpayers. But that's why we've written you know, these guides on this to make it as easy as possible. So that's kind of the big takeaway. And then that's a natural into, if I had to pick just sort of one tool that comes out of this section, it would be right there on page six, there is this flow chart on determining ministerial tax status. This is a super helpful, it's a visual tool. It's based on a series of yes or no questions to help you determine if you're doing this analysis to say, okay, we have a particular worker and um, you know this is kind of their background and their duties, this is going to help you in determining whether a worker qualifies as a minister or not. And it's important, these questions are really framed not based on theological definitions, because that's kind of a separate issue. It's also not a matter of personal opinion, do you like it or not? It's really in this area, it's the law and the IRS guidelines that matter. And so that flowchart will help you walk through that as a, as, a, as a helpful tool. And so then kind of next up would be one integrity tip from this area. And that would be coming back to a point that I just made earlier, which is the 
proper social security treatment of ministers. And just to unpack that, when an individual qualifies as a minister in the eyes of the IRS, he or she automatically becomes subject to social security under self-employment, those SECA rules, and is not eligible for FICA type social security treatment like you would treat most employees. So again, that's what we must do. And really why this is an integrity tip or an integrity point is because treating the minister properly not only ensures that the law is being followed, but also that taxes are being paid appropriately. So at this point, Julie, I know I'm preaching to the choir. <laughs> so That's right. I'll stop there with that integrity tip and turn it over to you uh, to lead us in compensation planning. That's right. Chapter two is on compensation planning. Now, this is the the tax guide for ministers, but this is some good information for the churches to use as well. The big takeaway that I chose in this one is that planning compensation includes planning for taxes. There are basically what I would call three buckets within the compensation for the ministers. And that's in addition to the cash compensation, it's fringe benefits. And a lot of those fringe benefits are either tax favored or tax free benefits. You want to put as much of the compensation towards those tax-free, tax-favored items as possible. Think about things like retirement, health insurance, maybe other insurance coverages. The other thing that to look at is in the tax-favored category is the housing allowance. That's something that you can get to the minister. It's going to reduce the tax burden, and it's going to get the most cash into the pocket of your minister because while you want to fairly compensate them. You also want to make sure you're getting the net amount into their pocket, less for taxes. The, that leads into the tool that I sh chose because the tool is a worksheet that's going to allow you to look at as a minister or for the church looking at your minister, what's the current salary look like? And then do some planning. And again, it focuses on those three buckets, cash compensation, fringe benefits, housing allowance and making sure you've done the planning to reduce the tax burden to the greatest amount you can. The integrity to on this uh, section on compensation planning is independent compensation approval. As the governing board of your church, yes, you're going to want to meet with your pastor, understand their financial needs, but when it comes time to make the decision, do the approval for the compensation, the minister does need to be recused from the meeting at that point. So that's an important integrity tip. Now, moving on, I'll take chapter three as well. And that talks about the pay package kind of in general. The big takeaway here is having an accountable expense reimbursement plan. An accountable expense reimbursement plan allows the church to reimburse the minister for documented ministry expenses without any tax implication. And as we just talked about, we want to get the most dollars to the minister. When a church just gives an allowance for ministry expenses, in general, that technically should be included in the taxable income for the minister. So having that accountable expense reimbursement plan is the best manner to handle those ministry expenses. And moving on to the tool. This one is a really handy reporting grid. It allows you to look at compensation, fringe benefits, reimbursements, and look at what's taxable, what's not, how might it be recorded. I mean, a good example here would be a church that's providing a vehicle to their minister. Uh, they're probably going to have some personal use of that vehicle. It's hard to avoid that. What's the tax implications? Is that taxable? going onto that grid, you can find it, look and see, yes, that's taxable for the personal use. It needs to be recorded, uh, reported in the minister's W-2 taxable income. But it's a quick guide. You'll find that on pages 60 and 61. Great reference, both for the minister and the church. The integrity tip here, I've just talked a little bit about making sure you're using those fringe benefits to get some good tax-free or tax favor benefits to the minister. But be aware of non-discrimination rules. Some of these fringe benefits are going to have non-discrimination rules. And if you don't comply with those, then suddenly that fringe benefit is now taxable. So make sure that you're aware of those and in compliance. Great. Well, Julie, you know, I was just thinking as you were sharing, so 
we've talked to you about a lot of technical terms and kind of numbers and rules and tax and all. But uh, I do want to just ask you a quick question, which is, what have you seen from the impact of compensation planning done well? Because I think there is a bigger story here than besides just kind of following all the rules or maximizing taxes. Like, as you've seen organizations do this really well with their staff, um, if you could just kind of quickly, like, what is a what is the impact from that from organizations who do this compensation planning well? Sure. And some of this will get into something we're going to talk about a little bit later. But when the church really helps do this planning well, it's a blessing to the minister and it's a blessing to their families when that housing allowance is is clearly laid out and putting as much compensation towards that as possible. It helps save taxes, uh, p- doing those fringe benefits, helping a minister planning and making sure they're putting funds towards retirement. All of these are going to bless that minister and by nature bless their family as well. But putting the time in to plan and not just last minute, we did this last year, let's do this again. If planning has not been a part of your church board governance, take the time this year to plan that really well. Yeah. <laughs> Amen to everything you said. I'm thinking about some instances I've seen. And Julie, I've literally seen even just this conversation or planning shift the relational dynamic <laughs> between you know a staff member and the organization. And I think it really is uh, is a way that we can it's not the only way but an important way that we can show care you know yes who are who are leading the ministries and serving the ministries and so i think it's really powerful and that was important for us just to take a moment as we're talking about all these rules to say hey it's even beyond that into the way that we can really truly like you said bless and impact those who are serving so well with that we'll take now just one other element of um, taxes for ministers, and and as Julie mentioned, kind of part of this overall plan. And so you want to highlight, there's one particular area too that um, is worth major attention, which is uh, the housing exclusion. And here in the section of the guide, as we unpack the housing exclusion, the one big takeaway here is remember this, the housing allowance is the minister's best friend for tax purposes, <laughs> their best friend. With that being said, though, there are some other notes that we should understand, which is the housing allowance benefit. It's an exclusion of these amounts from income tax for the pastor, for the minister, but not Social Security taxes. So that's kind of an important point. It relates to income tax, not Social Security tax. And even though this is the best friend for tax purposes, it does come with rules and limits. And so we'll just kind of walk through those quickly for ministers who provide their own home, <clears throat> which that's the most common you know, scenario that we see these days. The benefit is limited to the lowest of three factors. The first one being the amount that is actually used by the minister from their current ministerial income to provide the home. So kind of the amount that is actually used. Another factor would be the amount that's been officially designated by the church. So think of that as kind of the resolution, the designation, that's the other factor. And then the third one is there's also a limitation we need to consider of the fair rental value of the home, including utilities and furnishings. And again, it's the lowest of those three amounts. So that takes me to um, just in applying all of these, you know, different rules and limits. The tool uh, from this section that I would highlight is On pages 77 to 79, there's these three housing allowance worksheets. We hear all the time from folks who are using these saying, hey, this is an awesome tool to help maximize the housing allowance benefit. Because again, there may be some things we didn't think of that can be included under that benefit while also staying IRS compliant. So I commend those three different versions uh, to you. And they're, they're set up depending on whether or not the home is owned or rented and also whether it's by the church or the minister. Uh, So I think you'll find those to be helpful. And then moving into the integrity tip, it really relates to applying the limits on the exclusion. Again, as we were just saying, the housing allowance designation for a qualified minister really comes down to an action that's required by the church that's done formally and that's done in advance. That's kind of the church's part but it's the minister's responsibility 
to then determine how much of the housing allowance designation actually qualifies for exclusion from you know the federal income tax and perhaps others as well. So to say that in an, another way, really this can become an integrity issue as you're thinking about it and thinking about those limits, right? So if there's a surplus, let's just say, in the amount that has been designated by the employer that's above what's actually used by the minister, um, it then becomes important that <clears throat> the minister, when they're reporting for tax purposes, um, they're the ones, it's kind of up to their integrity to apply those limits that we talked about earlier and to, again, report the lower of the amount in this example of the one that was actually used. Um, and that's what's excluded for tax purposes. So that's a quick word on housing exclusion, the best friend of the minister. Let's talk for a moment about business expenses, which also can, um, you know, there's some keeping up with it that makes the life of a minister more complicated, but it's also when done properly, it's really going to help them significantly. So the big takeaway here is, Remember the five W's, the five W's when it comes to documenting expenses. And now um, Julie and I are assuming, we're, again, we're kind of preaching to the choir. Those who are on the webinar uh, are ones, you're on top of all these things. But the five W's may be a helpful way to explain uh, for those of you who may be working with others in the organization and you're having to kind of track down documentation of expenses and all these things. Use these five W's to help explain what's needed on the documentation. The five W's being the why. So we need to document the business, really the ministry purpose of the expense. You know, what was it? The description of the expense, including an itemized accounting of cost. Uh, the when is self-explanatory, the where. But also this one, Julie, I see miss from time to time, and that is the who. Um, so be sure to include on the expenses, uh, for example, if it's a meal, the names of those for whom the expense was occurred. Those are your five W's and a big takeaway from this section. Also want to highlight one really helpful tool uh, on page 97. And again, I don't know, maybe I'm a visual learner because I seem to be kind of pulling out all these visuals, but this, this one I've not seen you know, in other places. I think it is really helpful and it's on commuting versus business miles. This illustration really brings great clarity um, to when you have transportation expenses and you're trying to determine, okay, are these deductible? Are they not? Because um, you know it makes a difference. So from your home to a regular work location, a temporary work location, this is helpful for pastors who are often traveling, you know, outside the four walls of the church all the time on ministry assignments. This tool is going to help you make that determination of what is commuting versus what is personal, um, and to to really kind of help you sort out all of those details. And then finally, here with an integrity tip. And this relates to just keeping in mind, you know, personal versus business expenses. Integrity in the expense reimbursements in this area, it really starts by determining if the expenses are truly business expenses. So I just want to mention here quickly um, what's meant by that from an IRS standpoint. It's not just kind of what we call a business expense. But it has to meet certain criteria, and that is that it be a business expense is one that is ordinary, one that's common and accepted in a in a particular field, and also one that's necessary. Um, the expense it needs to be helpful and appropriate for a particular field. So all that to say on this integrity point, not just the law, but also integrity, really requires the faithful application of the ordinary and necessary rule when you're determining personal versus business expenses. Well, Julie, I think now we turn to uh, another planning point and that's on retirement, right? Yeah, I think you gave me this one because I'm closer to retirement than you. <laughs> yeah, who assigned these? I don't know. So chapter six covers retirement planning and social security. My big takeaway here is maximizing those 403B contributions. Now, Michael just said that Housing allowance is a, uh, a minister's best friend. I think the second best friend may be 403B contributions. So we've already talked about a little bit that a minister is considered to be self-employed when it comes to Social Security. So they're subject to that SECA tax. 
A 403B contribution reduces not only the income tax for the minister, but it reduces the CICA tax as well. So that's a big benefit. In addition, for most ministers, you're going to be able to claim that housing allowance into retirement as well. And what that's going to do is that's going to allow you to offset and either eliminate the tax implication of your 403B distributions or or at least lower it. So it puts a minister in a situation that they can save taxes when they contribute to the 403B and save or maybe eliminate completely the taxes when they receive the distributions back out. This is a great thing. Make sure you're maximizing those contributions to the extent you can. And the tool that I've chosen is a countdown table that's on page 109. We know there's a lot of decisions that have to be made going into retirement. However, many of those need to be made well before you get to retirement. This table is great because it walks you through what are those decisions I need to be making and what's a time frame. So that's a good reference point. The integrity tip, and we talked about the Clergy Act and we've talked a little bit about opting out of Social Security. If you are a minister that's early on in your career, we just wanna point out from an integrity standpoint, opting out of the Social Security system is, should be out of a conscientious theological objection to receiving government insurance. It's not a tax planning decision, not an economic decision. So that's a good integrity point to remember. Chapter seven, moving on, we're going to talk about paying taxes. And since I spent a lot of years in this career, it's a good chapter for me. The tax takeaway here is that the voluntary tax withholding, you need to volunteer. Because a minister is considered to be self-employed and subject to seek a tax, they're not subject to income tax withholding. So it's voluntary for them to do that. It's voluntary for the church to do the withholding. But some extra time here and extra effort is going to pay off. Doing withholding throughout the year is far more efficient than having to save up the estimated taxes and file and pay those throughout the year. In addition, if you're estimating your taxes, if you make that payment late, it's going to be subject to a penalty, whereas the withholding is deemed to be paid throughout the year. So this is an area where you really want to do that voluntary withholding and make sure that you have set that withholding high enough to cover the minister's income tax plus the CICA tax, which leads into the tool that I chose. So the tool that I chose is a worksheet that's going to help you make those calculations because whether you're doing estimated taxes or you're going to have that withholding, this worksheet is going to help you calculate what is the amount that I need to either withhold or estimate. You can find that on page 129, really helpful tool. The integrity tip here is filing and paying on time. If you file your tax return late, if you pay the balance due on that tax return late, or if you pay, file and pay your estimates late, all three of those are going to create penalties. Once you're late on paying the taxes and you've added a penalty, it makes it even harder to get caught back up. So the integrity tip, just stay on time with all your filing and all your payments. Well, Julie, great advice uh, that we'll all be following. Thank you for that. Some, some good wise tips there. <clears throat> I do want to also just quickly mention before we transition to more of the church and nonprofit side of things, the employer side of things, there's also a great section as well in the minister's guide that I'd say really brings it all together. And that is, um, again, an example of with the Form 1040. Um, this is something that we update each year that just shows, okay, line by line, <laughs> you know, if you're a pastor and you're working through your tax returns, this is what all the lines are going to look like in the different schedules. Um, and so that's helpful. And then we also provide a couple different examples of sample returns that are fi uh, filed as well. And we have two different examples. One is for active ministers and the other would be for a retired minister. And so uh, just want to mention that those are available as well. So you're kind of saying, okay, Michael and Julie, you guys have covered a lot of different things here and all these different parts and pieces like how does it all come together? We've got some great examples of that in the line-by-line -line section, as well as the sample returns. 
So with that, and again, keeping in mind that there may be some questions as we are progressing today throughout the webinar, I do just want to remind everyone again, we invite those questions. You can share them with us at any time throughout the webinar by clicking ask in the Q&A tab or by emailing us at webinar at ecfa.org. Whichever is easier, um, we're going to do our best, work hard to answer as many of those questions as possible. So with that, Julie, we are going to switch gears now. We've been talking a lot about really more of that personal side of um, the tax implications and the issues for ministers. But now we also want to look at things from a employer perspective or the church and nonprofit side. So could you kick us off with the first section on the church and nonprofit guide? Sure. And even if we, we may not have said this at the beginning, but everything that we're saying is pointing you back to the guide. And that's because it's a treasure trove of information. As, we, as Michael was talking about those samples, I used these guides early on in my career in public accounting because of the depth of information that's available. So yes, we're pointing you to the guides. They're provided free. There's a lot of good information you want to take advantage of. The first thing we want to start with here for the church, the ministry, is the financial integrity foundations. What's the foundation that we're starting with here? The big takeaway is the importance of an independent board. Having a focus on putting the ministry first is going to go back to the foundation of having that independent board a board who's monitoring conflicts of interest and related party transactions. You want to make sure that your board is independent. That not only protects the ministry, it protects the board, gives everyone confidence. The tool that I chose here is what you look at on a related party transaction. It can be easy for a ministry to think, maybe we should just not have any related party transactions, but sometimes they just make sense. But what do you need to consider? And I love what this goes through on page 12, and that's looking at exclude, compare, determine, and document. Exclude the person who has a conflict of interest from your decision. A compare. Make sure you're getting comparable information, such as a competitive bid. Uh, determine, you know, determine as, a, as an independent body, is this transaction in the best interest of our ministry? and then document. So document that decision into your board minutes, but not just the decision, document those factors. So if there is a question that comes up, you can go back and say, These, this is what we looked at in making that determination. The integrity tip here is it starts at the top. When you want biblical financial accountability within your ministry, it starts with your board, it starts with your top leaders, and then it permeates down through your staff. So make sure you are at the top as a leader, setting the tone for that biblical financial accountability. Absolutely. We see that all the time, every day, <laughs> really here at ECFA, the importance of that point. So Julie, I appreciate you bringing that out. And now we're going to turn to a really a key issue for, for a lot of the organizations, again, that, that we're talking to, and that is the issue of tax exemption, tax exemption. The one big takeaway in this section is that qualifying for federal tax exemption, it does come with some conditions and it's not absolute. <laughs> you know, sometimes we want to put a banner on it and say, oh, well, we're a tax exempt organization. Well, there's really some things that we need to understand related to conditions on that and the fact that it's, again, not absolute. So conditions, things like paying reasonable compensation to staff, that's a condition staying current with IRS filings, for example, like the IRS Form 990, if that applies to you. Those would be some examples of conditions that come along with tax exemption. Also, being a 501c3, it's not an absolute exemption from all income tax. <clears throat> there may be tax liability when a church or ministry has what's called unrelated business income, unrelated business income or UBI, and that is a good segue to the next tool, which is just kind of highlighted from this chapter. <clears throat> and that is the sample unrelated business income checklist on page 29. UBI, this must have been written by lawyers, Julie, because <laughs> <laughs> not only there are exceptions, but there are exceptions to exceptions and definitions. And so with all that, it can be very complex. And this tool helps break it down into bite-sized pieces 
to help you determine whether your ministry may be exempt or if you have tax liability for UBI um, under, under a particular situation. So that's a very helpful tool. And then let's talk for a moment on an integrity tip. Let's just talk about the church audit potential. The reality is very few churches are audited each year. But the danger that's associated with that is for churches and ministries that would think about that and that would conduct their financial operations beyond the, the, beyond the bounds of the law, believing that they're never going to be audited. I know that is not true for anybody who is on the webinar, but it does go without saying that integrity requires compliance with the law, even if the IRS or state regulators never call. It's all about integrity. We answer to a much higher authority. I will agree, going back to what you said, the unrelated business income has more exceptions than I believe any section of tax law. So that checklist is very helpful. Moving on to chapter three, we're going to look at compensating employees. And again, before we talked about compensation, kind of from specifically from the minister standpoint, now we're looking at in a broader base for the organization. Big takeaway here is who qualifies for a housing allowance? And Michael talked about this a little bit as well. But what I want to look at is in addition to the the five criteria that the IRS has established for who qualifies as a minister and that can lead into a housing allowance. There's also this idea of where does a minister serve? Think about like a parachurch organization. Does a minister serving with a parachurch organization qualify for those ministerial benefits like a housing allowance? Maybe. There's some specific rules around that and you need to follow them very carefully so if you're a parachurch organization that has a minister serving or a minister serving with a parachurch, you want to read this information in this chapter and make sure that you're following those steps carefully. The tool that I chose here is a sample housing allowance resolution. I love a sample, whether it's at Costco or in the tax guide. <laughs> but this in particular makes quick work of the board approving those housing allowances, just plug and play with those resolutions. Just an additional tip on this, if you're a church that has evangelists coming in and speaking, guest speakers, and you want to need to uh, designate a portion of an honorarium as a housing allowance, there's also a sample resolution for that as well. Integrity tip here is when you're compensating your employees, don't ignore the fair, the <laughs> don't ignore FLSA, the, the Federal <laughs> Labor Standards Act. <laughs> the integrity tip here is don't ignore the Federal Labor Standards Act. While for a church, most ministers are going to be in general exempt from FLSA, the other church staff are not. And for ministries, this is something you need to be aware of. You also need to be thinking about state labor laws and how that's going to apply to minimum wage, how that's going to apply to paying overtime. And also be thinking about your remote workers. If you've got a remote worker who lives and therefore works in a state that is different from where your organization is headquartered, you need to be aware of what are the laws in that state as well. Absolutely. Very relevant uh, issues there, Julie, in terms of compensation. And so we're going to tackle next employer reporting. And again, the, the big takeaway here is we talked a lot today about what it looks like to compensate appropriately and to plan for and to do all those things. The big takeaway here is that um, there's also the issue of once compensation has been paid to employees, it needs to be properly reported. And so we're all familiar with, you know, employees, they need to be given Form W-2 that assists with their personal income tax filings with the IRS that needs to be done by January 31st, coming right up. Um, and so be mindful of that. We do want to highlight too, again, some uniquenesses with minister employees, and that is there's no requirement uh, to withhold income taxes but they may be withheld under that voluntary withholding agreement. That's what Julie was referencing as well um, just a few sections ago. For other lay employees, those who are not ministers, as employers, we do need to withhold and pay FICA and income taxes. So a couple key takeaways there. 
related to employer reporting. And so the tool actually gets into um, some myths, and that is on independent contractors. Um, that's on page 74. You know, <clears throat> Julie, I'm sure you've seen this too, these myths that just kind of go, go around and they never seem to end. Um, you know, in terms of who can be an independent contractor and get out of some of these employee uh, reporting issues. And so this is a tool that brings truth to some of those myths so that you can stay IRS compliant. One example would be, you know, a group might say, well, we have a written contract. And so that makes a person an independent contractor. No, not necessarily. The fact is, it's the substance of the relationship that governs. And so this tool really kind of walks through myths and facts and will help keep all of that straight for you. The integrity tip here is on worker classification issues. Too often we have seen with organizations, it might make a decision on employee versus independent contractor based on what the, you know, considering the, FI the FICO social security cost or perhaps other paperwork cost. And the reality is that the social security cost factor has no relationship to an appropriate employee versus independent contractor decision. It's not about that. I understand those are business considerations, but that's not ultimately what we're looking to here. Integrity really requires the proper evaluation of worker classification to ensure that workers are receiving the benefits that they're entitled to. That's an important integrity tip. Moving now from employer reporting to more general information reporting, we also have a whole chapter dedicated to this as well. And so that is the big takeaway. Reporting requirements go well beyond just employees. You're probably thinking, um, just like <clears throat> we are here too, most commonly, you know, payments of $600 or more in a calendar year to an independent contractor, those trigger the filing of the Form 1099 NEC. That stands for non-employee compensation. So that's an example of those information reporting requirements. Um, there are some others as well that are touched on in this chapter as well, depending on payments and receipts that are made. So <clears throat> with that, one helpful tool, there are so many forms, so little time, there's so much to keep track of. This tool is really your one page summary to know, <clears throat> excuse me, which form you want to file under what circumstances the summary of payment reporting requirements on page 109. Keep it handy. It is so helpful. Um, then moving now into an integrity tip. And this one is on reporting of payments to independent contractors. This becomes an integrity issue because there's, again, generally no tax to withhold when it comes to independent contractors. So it can be easy for an organization to overlook the filing of a Form 1099 NEC. But when a ministry fails to file that required form, it may be inadvertently giving an independent contractor a license to avoid reporting taxable income, because otherwise, you know, who would know, right? So the important point here is that integrity requires the proper filing of Form 1099 NEC and really all those other forms in the 1099 series when they, imply, when they apply. That's an important uh, integrity tip. And if I can make it a suggestion on this one, is it's a great idea for the ministry to have a policy in place that requires the receipt of a W-9, a properly completed W-9, before making a payment to the contractor. If you've made, once you've made the payment to the contractor, sometimes it's hard to get that W-9 completed, including getting the either the social security number or the um, employer identification number. So getting that before you will pass payment over is a best practice. Absolutely. <clears throat> Good for, yeah, not only being able to hear back from them, but also for your own sake, making sure that they're all tracked, right? And that we don't inadvertently miss some. So that's a great, great tip, Julie. All right, well, I'm going to move now into financial management and reporting. I hear a big amen, you know, from everybody who's on this webinar. This is just as important to you as it is to ECFA. And so um, a chapter on this, one big takeaway is that sound financial record keeping, it is crucial, right? It's crucial. It helps board and staff make well-informed decisions. How else can we make 
the decisions we need to make without sound financial record keeping. It helps the organization run smoothly. It helps us demonstrate financial accountability and integrity. Um, it is so critical. And that's why we've devoted an entire chapter here. It touches on a lot of issues, but I do want to highlight one tool, and that is the cash reserves worksheet on page 128. Uh, Julie, I don't know about you, but I seem to be getting a lot more questions lately about cash reserves and whether that's because organizations have budgeted conservatively and so they've kind of grown cash reserves or maybe they're experiencing tough times and so they're saying we need to build cash reserves. Um, this is a great starting point because again, cash reserves, they're so critical for ministries to be prepared for, again, those unexpected challenges, but also to take advantage of unanticipated opportunities. And the reality is cash reserves are often stated in terms of months. We commonly see that, you know, months to cover operational or maybe other expenses. So the starting point to achieving appropriate reserves or hitting that goal, hitting that target, it's like anything else. You really have to know where are we now? <laughs> and so how much do we have? And then it will help you project those out into the future based on income, expenses, and savings. And that's really your formula for helping build those cash reserves. So we recommend that tool to you. And then here, an integrity tip. This one is on preventing and detecting fraud. Just a quick word about that. I think we all do need to recognize that no ministry is beyond the possibility of being a fraud victim. We don't like to think about that, but we have to be alert, You know, be prepared, um, because well-planned internal controls and ongoing monitoring by ministry leaders, that'll really help us prevent um, as many possible opportunities for fraud as we can. So just as we touch on that chapter in the financial uh, management you know, side of things, Julia, I just wanted to highlight that important integrity tip related to fraud prevention. Oh, that's great. We're going to move on to chapter seven, which is charitable gifts. The takeaway that I chose here is there is no tax deduction for services donated to a charity. This is always a confusing item for donors, maybe even for ministries, especially because you could have a situation where you can't value the services and offer a tax receipt, but as a ministry, you may have to value and record those services. Let me give an example here. Perhaps you have like a doctor who's serving with a crisis pregnancy center. While you can't value the services of that doctor and provide them a tax receipt for it, you do as a ministry under generally accepted accounting principles need to value those services and record it into the financial statements. So that can seem like you know a little bit of, I, I don't do it on this side, but I do it on this side. But just the clarity of there is no tax deduction for services, um, just keep that in mind. The tool that I chose here is a sample charitable gift acknowledgement. This one in particular is for when a donor has given a gift to the organization, but they've received something of value back. We call that a quid pro quo transaction. So this might be where they've attended a, a, a gala or participated in a golf tournament. That This sample will walk you through what does that wording need to be to acknowledge that gift. And then the integrity tip here on charitable gifts is a giver privacy policy that you should have one. The donors need to know that their personal information is being protected, but they also have a right to understand how you're going to use their personal information, especially if you plan to share it with another organization. So having a policy, if you don't have one, recommend that you get this instituted and then putting it someplace like on your website where a donor can access that and know what your policy is. And then chapter eight, moving on to our final chapter of these guides. This one covers spe special charitable gift issues. My big takeaway that I chose here is that proper handling of funds raised for a short-term mission trip that can be challenging. There's a lot of good information in this chapter, but I chose to focus on the short-term mission trips. I know many of our churches have youth ministries out during short-term mission trips, and, and a lot of our other ministries are doing these. And there's a lot of challenges to this. And the one in particular that just to know is 
a donation for a short-term mission trip is made to the organization that's sponsoring the trip. So even if it's preferenced for a specific trip participant, the gift is to the organization and therefore in general, there should not be a refund of that donation if the participant is not able to go on the trip. And so the tool I chose goes right along with that. We have a sample fundraising letter for a short-term mission trip. I love this letter because it gives good clarity to the fact that the donation is to the ministry. And it also gives clarity to if this trip participant is not able to go, here's how the funds would be used. That's great to put in a potential donor's hand. So you're making them aware before they even give the gift, this is what will happen with those funds, how they're going to be used. So the integrity tip here is to, if you don't have a policy on refunds for your short-term mission trips, establish one, publish it. Uh, you're going to be sending information out to this trip participant about the trip. When you do include your refund policy, include a sample letter like the one that's in here that gives clarity to the whole issue. Make sure that not only the donor understands your refund policy, but making sure your trip participant understands your, your refund policy. That trip participant is going to be basically speaking on behalf of your ministry as they speak at churches, as they speak in front of groups, whether it's by sending a letter or verbally, you want to make sure that they understand and are doing the proper wording. Using Having a policy and then using a sample letter it are great ways to get that established. Julie, I love it. I love that you landed there because I think that issue around, yeah, the special things we see in, in kind of the missionary and fundraising context, um, that is an area where can be confusing, but through these samples, through these explanations, hopefully make it a lot easier <laughs> for folks. And so I think that's just such a great example of, of the heart behind all the content that we've shared and presented today and what's in these guides is you take just one of those issues and there's someone in ministry who could spend hours, you know, trying to sort that out, trying to figure it out. But by utilizing these tools, it really saves so much time, makes things more simple, easier to focus on ministry. So thank you for for landing with that. That's that's a great uh, final point from that chapter. And just as we do wind down uh, our time together today on the webinar, in just these last few minutes, remember, hopefully throughout the webinar, you know, been able to share whatever questions that you might have. But if you haven't taken that opportunity yet, please do now. You can continue to ask your questions by clicking ask in the Q&A tab or by emailing us at webinar at ecfa.org. Um, we have just a couple more important announcements as we answer those questions and as we wrap up. Well, hopefully by now we have communicated well that as a gift for attending this live webinar, you're getting a free copy of the 2024 ECFA tax guide. So as we mentioned throughout the presentation, all those different tools and things that are in place, um, that is a free gift to you. And um, you have the details there in your email on, on how to get that. We'll send that again tomorrow as well with some additional instructions. But all of the takeaways, all the tools, all the integrity tips that we covered today are covered in much greater depth in these guides, plus many topics that we didn't have time to cover today. You can find all the details about the tax guides at ecfa.org slash tax guides. Well, next, we want to take this opportunity to say a very sincere thank you to many of our more than 2,700 ECFA members who are represented on today's webinar. For other friends who are also with us today, how do you ensure that your ministry is pursuing integrity in the eyes of your donors? We often discuss the importance of accountability partners for personal integrity, but similar principles apply to organizations as well. And so at ECFA, we desire to step into that role of accountability with ministries who wish to demonstrate a commitment to integrity through ECFA's seven standards of responsible stewardship. You can visit ecfa.org slash join for more information on ECFA membership, as well as all the benefits that come with that as well. Next, we invite you to stay connected with ECFA to stay informed. Follow ECFA on social media for a chance to win incredible giveaways, stay in the loop with the latest ministry news, access exciting resource offers, and my favorite, be inspired. Be inspired by the incredible stories of what God is doing through our ECFA members worldwide. 
Follow us and join the conversation as we celebrate these stories, share resources, and foster a community dedicated to trust. Well, that brings us to the end of today's ECFA webinar on 2024 Taxes Made Easy. We hope this has been meaningful to you. You'll be receiving another email tomorrow with a link to the recording and other related materials. Again, I'd like to thank Julie for her great presentation and insight, and for each person who joined us today for this webinar. God bless you and your ministry in 2024. Thanks again for tuning in.